Are people afraid of you, Beth? Uh-huh. Who's afraid of you, Beth? John. Your brother. And what is your brother? Why is your brother afraid of you? Because I've heard him so much. Is she bluffing? How could a six-year-old talk her brother and show so little emotion about it? Sadly, they can. Beth Thomas didn't have a normal childhood. She didn't even have a less than ideal childhood. It was simply the stuff of nightmares. And when she was adopted by a new set of parents, she brought all her rage into their home. It would be a long and hard journey until Beth would finally realize what she was going through. And then the real hardship would begin. I must warn you, this case is really tough to watch. There's discussions of child abuse, neglect, assault, and death. But if you're ready, let's dive into the case of Beth Thomas. Beth Thomas was born in 1983, somewhere in the southern United States. The first 19 months of her life are simply too gruesome to mention, but they will be revealed later. However, our story begins in 1984, when the Tennant family adopted Beth and her little brother, John. Tim and Julie had been married for 12 years, and they'd been trying to have a baby for a while, but to no avail. When they found out they weren't biologically compatible, they decided to adopt. In early 1984, the Department of Social Services called Tim. They had two siblings immediately available. We did not need children to make our lives complete. We felt secure in ourselves and secure in our relationship, but we wanted to share that with somebody else. And we felt like we had a lot to pass on to a child, and that was what we really wanted to do. And when the phone call came, it was like, at last is here. The tenants were just elated. Just weeks after registering, they received a call. And it seemed like a miracle. It had happened so quick. We had heard of couples having to wait five, ten years on, on a child. And here we had two young children. Um, it was like the answer to our dream. Soon enough, Tim and Julie became the parents of 19-month-old Beth and 7-month-old John. It might have felt like a dream in the beginning, but it soon turned into a nightmare. At first glance, Beth and John were perfectly normal kids, but there was something truly off about Beth's behavior, and this became very clear from her first months in the new home. We had the kids with us, uh, Beth and her younger brother John, for uh, probably a couple of months until we began to learn something about their background and their past. And when we learned it, uh, some things seemed to fall in place. Indeed, social services didn't give the tenants any information about the two children until they started digging. And when they did, they uncovered a very disturbing story. From several sources, we discovered that, uh, that they didn't have enough food to eat. The children were and isolated for days on end. When Child Protection Services found baby John, he was lying in a urine-filled bassinet with empty bottles on the floor. His head was flat in the back and bulged out in the front. This is because he spent most of his life alone on his back in the bassinet. At uh, seven months, he couldn't raise his head, couldn't roll over. Um, he was uh, just had, had no stimulation. And uh, we think perhaps that it happened to Beth, and it wasn't very long until uh, she began showing some signs of perhaps uh, even some of A child might not remember what happened in the first months of their life consciously, but the subconscious stores everything, especially traumatic moments. Beth was about three years old when she had a terrible nightmare. When she told her parents about it, they knew her situation at her first home was much worse than they'd imagined. Tell me about your birth father. What was that nightmare like? When he touched my Okay. Until it bled. Hurted a lot until it bled. And, um, wouldn't be me a lot. He me. Wouldn't be very nice to me. How old were you? One. And in your nightmare, what happens? I get lost again. When Beth was just one year old, her mother died. 
When her father was left alone with the kids, he let out the most sinister kind of monster. This trauma completely changed who Beth was. Where's your birth? Where's your birth father? What's he doing? He's right there, and there's his hand. His hand's right there. Where? Right there. You can't hardly see it because it's green. Beth felt incredibly hurt and sad. But her trauma was so deep, she had blocked all her emotions. When she spoke to psychologist Dr. Ken McGid about hurting her brother, she showed no remorse or emotion. And what would you do to him, Beth? Okay. What would you do? Beth continuously tormented her little brother. She simply hated every single person around her because as far as she knew, People were evil. And because John was the smallest, weakest person around her, that's who she would most, him and the family pets. But this kind of aggression at our animals and even uh, at her brother Jonathan was beginning to, uh, to grow to such an excess that our life was miserable at home. We had, John would cry uh, in the mornings and say his stomach hurt. We, for the longest time, we thought maybe this child has, uh, uh, has some problem with his intestinal area or maybe he has allergies. Tim and Julie had John checked out by doctors, but he was fine from a medical point of view. When his parents weren't watching, Beth would kick him in the stomach and stick pins in him. Then it escalated even more. She wasn't even hiding away from her parents anymore. By this time, she had tried to kill John on several occasions and, and openly admitted that. One time, Julie heard some awful screaming coming from the basement. When she ran downstairs, she found Beth John's head repeatedly against the cement floor. John was crying and begging Beth to stop, but she didn't want to. She wanted him dead. Did you get real mad at him? Did, did you hit his head real hard? Tell me about it. What did, how many times did you do it? A lot? Hmm. What was the floor like? Clean up. And what happened to your brother? Tell me about it. His head hurt real bad, but his chin, he had to have stitches in it. Even though she realized John was in a lot of pain, she simply didn't want to stop. Could you stop? Use your words back. Uh. Okay. What was your brother doing when you were doing this? With the, with the toys. Okay. And believe me, it only gets worse. One day, Julie noticed some of her largest kitchen knives were missing. My first thought was Beth. And I felt a little guilty about it at first. I thought, no. Nah. But um, I, I really didn't even mention it to her. They'd been gone several weeks. She was sitting at the table drawing and mentioned to me, what do those knives look like that are gone, Mom? And I said, what knives, Beth? Beth perfectly described the missing knives, but didn't outright admit to stealing them. She was only five, but she was playing mind games with her mom. Then she just smiled at Julie. And um, I knew then, and then this little smile that's not, not a sweet smile, but a malicious type of smile. And I knew then I thought she's got them. When she spoke to Dr. Ken McGid, Beth blatantly admitted to stealing them and lying to her mom about it. I got them from the dishwasher. What kind of knives? Um. Big sharp ones. Then one night, Julie woke up to Beth having a fit. When she confronted her, this is what she heard. By now, Beth slept locked inside her room every single night for John's protection. But now, Tim and Julie started fearing for their lives too. After Beth's murderous moment, Tim and Julie realized she really is a psychopathic killer, as outrageous as this sounds for a six-year-old. This is when they called for specialized help, and Dr. Ken McGid started talking to Beth. At nighttime, what do your parents do to your door? 
lock it shut. Mm, why do they lock it shut? Because they don't want me to hurt John. Right. And they're kind of afraid of of hurting John? Of you hurting John? Mm-hmm. Okay. Are they afraid that you might hurt them? Yep. Would you, Beth? Mm -hmm. Ken specializes in children with intense emotional trauma from a very young age. More specifically, he specializes in children diagnosed with RAD, or Reactive Attachment Disorder. Children with RAD have been through extreme and are unable to show or receive love and affection. They also don't have a conscience. In other words, they can't tell right from wrong, and they have no problem hurting someone. Ken now had to make Beth aware of her abuse and help her step outside her earliest memories. Slowly, he would show her how her trauma inflicted her behavior. But he would uncover some very disturbing facts in the process. Trigger warning, the following bit describes very inappropriate behavior in children. Feel free to skip a few minutes if this is not something you want to hear about. Does your brother have private parts? Um... Yeah. Yeah? And what do you do with your brother with his private parts, Ben? I heard it. Tragically, Beth was copying the exact same behavior that was done toward her by her biological dad. She was unable to show affection, but she felt obligated to show violence, the only form of affection she'd ever received. What's truly disturbing is that Beth knew very well what she was doing. She just didn't want to stop, like everyone was urging her to. What does he say? Stop. Okay, tell me that. Well, he says stop, but I don't stop. Do you hurt him? Mm-hmm. <laughs> A lot. Okay. And would you like to do that to other boys? <laughs> this only goes to show that Tim and Julie did the right thing when they took Beth to treatment early on. Imagine what she could have done as an adult without proper care. When I, I caught her with Jonathan one morning, she was texting him. Um, he was crying and his pants were down and I said, Beth, what's happening? It's hard to imagine what Jonathan went through at the hands of Beth. And it's hard to imagine what Tim and Julie felt every day. How do you deal with a six-year-old who molests her brother? Tragically, she would harm herself in the same way. Have you ever rubbed your private parts? Mm-hmm. Do you do it a lot? A lot. And because she was extremely young, she didn't realize this isn't something you do in public spaces. When we were at the hospital waiting for Tim to come out, he was there visiting. And Beth and John were in the back seat, and I turned around, and, and she had her legs spread and was masturbating in a public parking lot. And I had tried to explain to her new, numerous times before that, that that's private area. You don't do it in public places. And um, gone over that with her, and, and it never seemed to faze her. It's hard enough to hear about this, let alone live with it. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Beth also tormented the four family pets with pins. And one morning, Julie caught Beth a nest full of baby birds. The day before, Julie had seen her picking them up and had asked her not to. So we explained that she could hurt them, um, put them back, and went through a whole sitting down and talking to her about the problem of it. And the next day, we went out to check the baby birds, and they were on the ground dead with her, their necks broken. When discussing this terrible event, Ken tried to make Beth understand how preying on the weak is not okay. Are the baby birds kind of small? Can you describe them for me? Well, they don't have their eyes open, but they can hear, hear me, and they look up. Are they kind of helpless, little baby birds? Can they fly? No. Perhaps somewhere in her subconscious, she made the connection between the baby birds and her little brother. But it wasn't an immediate connection. For the first few months after starting the treatment, Beth was separated from her family. It was clear she wanted to kill them. She admitted it many times, so she needed to learn to be around people again. 
So in April 1989, Beth started living at a special home for children with an early attachment disorder, led by specialized psychologist named Connell Watkins. I have children that have numerous times, cold-blooded family members, neighbor children, them, and they can do it. Makes my blood run cold just thinking about nine years old. People don't think a nine-year-old is capable of cold-blooded murder, but they are. That attachment break does severe damage to the heart, the ability to care and the ability to love. If they don't care and they don't love, they're capable of anything. Beth was thus introduced to a world of rules. For the first time, she had to raise her hand to speak and request permission to go to the bathroom. This might seem odd, right? But there's a reason behind it. We're very strict very strict about everything. Everything is completely monitored. We take complete control because a child who's unattached does not trust. And because they don't trust, they don't allow anybody to be boss of them. So we take complete control. They are not boss of anything. They have to ask to get a drink of water. They have to ask to go to the bathroom. They have to ask to leave our site. Part of that is because we cannot trust them. Indeed, if you're working with killers, even if they're young, you have to have a rule or two. Then the psychologist taught Beth something else that she's not all bad, and that she deserves to let her good side out. They believe that they're evil, they believe they're from the devil, they believe that they are not a person of value, and we have to change that, and we have to build that from a child who's nothing, who's, who's a bad kid in their own mind, to a child who's valuable and loving, and they see themselves as that. So when you combine the strict rules with reinforcing good behavior, you develop a child's self-esteem. Whenever Beth did something right, she heard she was a good girl, a smart, kind person who was able to show love and affection. Within months, she showed empathy towards animals. When she was seven, Beth's adoptive family and the rehabilitation center decided she was well enough to attend public school. She had developed a sense of right and wrong and was responding to affection for the first time. Beth enjoyed singing in the church choir and, incredibly enough, she enjoyed chatting with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a beard. She's beard. There's his nose. That's his... Yeah, see his beard is kind of flowing in the wind and everything. As you can imagine, things started changing at home too. Within a year, Connell let Beth sleep with her own daughter. We had alarms on the door at night so she wasn't sneaking around doing things with the other children. We don't worry about that anymore. There's no alarm on her door at night now. She sleeps in the same room with my own daughter, and I trust her that much. She brushes the dogs, and I trust her that much. Because she has earned that trust, she's learned it, she's, she has a heart, and she has a love inside, and she feels bad when she does something now. It might sound like Beth was fully recovered at the age of seven or eight, but think about it. She was just beginning to comprehend the gravity of her actions to the day. Do you know where that anger came from? That's when my dad um, hurt me. I, I had it all inside and I remembered it and I started doing it. And what did, what did that do when it was inside? It made me want to hurt people really bad. And who did you hurt? My brother. My mom and dad and animals. And animals. Who did it hurt the most? My brother. It's heartbreaking. But even though she was only eight, Beth fully realized that she hurt herself the most. It hurt, it hurt me the most. How did it hurt you the most? Because when I hurt other people, um, I'm burning my um, dead self. How do you feel right now, Beth? Bad. It's kind of tough to talk about, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It is. The documentary about Beth, titled Child of Rage, came out in 1990. It really shocked its viewers. Seeing a child talk about murder the way that Beth did is pretty hard to swallow. Then, 
Decades passed and no one knew what happened to Beth. Had she stayed with the psychologists? Had she returned to her family? What about her brother? Then in 2010, Beth Thomas published her first memoir, Dandelion on My Pillow, Put Your Knife Beneath. She'd written it with Nancy and Tarina Thomas. Apparently Nancy was her new adoptive mother and Beth had taken her family name. It's unclear why Tim and Julie gave Beth to a new family. Perhaps it was for John's protection or perhaps they couldn't bear the responsibility anymore. Beth wrote her memoir when she was 19, and it would take a few more years until it would get published. In the book, she describes her own plight, as well as stories of other rad kids she's met during her lifetime. In 2015, Beth finally went public. She was a 32-year-old nurse with a bright smile, and she was ready to talk about her deepest traumas, hoping to inspire others to seek treatment. Here's where it gets creepy. There are just about a million details about her early life that not even her adoptive parents knew. Like that she and John had six more siblings. And then my birth mother died when I was 18 months old of kidney disease. So during that time, she was gone so much going into the hospital and dialysis. And at that time, I had six other siblings. And then shortly after I was born, about a year after I was born, my little brother was born. So there were quite a few children um, in this home. And it was, it was a very abusive environment. When she reached her teenage years, Beth was back with her adoptive family. And as she had new life experiences, she also started remembering more traumatic events from her past. The more she healed, the more trauma she uncovered. I became depressed and I had some traumatic memories arise when I also started to date and realized that something was not right. And so I actually did EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing because it's very um, good with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Beth first spoke about her trauma in front of a live audience when she was 16. It was a very scary experience, but that's when a mother thanked her for giving her hope for her child. From then on, Beth knew that she wanted to help others who were going through the same things that she did. After I healed from attachment disorder and going through intensive therapy to, to heal from that, I teach now about attachment disorder and how it was manifested in my life and how I healed and how others can heal too. And my goal is that there is hope provided in that. I became a nurse and I work in the neonatal ICU and I'm also a neonatal flight nurse. And my goal with that is to try to, to break that cycle that so many can get caught up in. Beth says that she deals with a lot of teenage moms who are scared to have a baby and who have experienced abuse in their families. So she talks them into breaking the toxic pattern and learning to love and care for their babies with confidence. Beth is an extremely brave person who has worked hard to break the pattern of violence. The fact that she is dedicating her life to helping others like her is really impressive. On November 18th, 2016, Beth got married. Her and her husband live in Flagstaff, Arizona. We can only hope that her brother John also has a peaceful, happy life. There is one last creepy twist in Beth Thomas's story. Remember how she was once treated by a psychologist named Connell Watkins? In 2000, Watkins killed a little girl in front of her adoptive mother during a really questionable therapy session. She was a beautiful 10-year-old girl, her whole life ahead of her, and she died tragically in April of 2000 because she was forced to take part in a rebirthing therapy session. Candace had been adopted out of the foster care system by a single woman, and like any child would, she missed her parents and her siblings, and her adoptive mother claimed that she and Candace were not bonding properly. Candace's adoptive mom, Jean, searched the internet for attachment problems therapy and found Connell Watkins. Connell was now experimenting with rebirthing. This involves wrapping a child in thick blankets and pushing against them with pillows for 70 minutes, stimulating a sort of birth. The child is supposed to struggle and scream so as to release that rage that blocks their attachment. But when Connell did this with Candace, 
Four adults were pushing into her, and she was simply suffocating. She screamed she was going to die 11 times on camera and in front of the whole staff, but no one batted an eyelid. When she emerged out of the blanket fort, she was dead. Connell Watkins was thus sentenced to seven years in prison. After Connell's trial, the rebirthing therapy was outlawed in Colorado, and other states followed. Indeed, some therapy methods are really inappropriate. Some even do more harm than good. But luckily for Beth, she wasn't caught in Connell's questionable practices, at least as far as we know. Beth's story is a tale of abuse, but also a tale of recovery. She went through hell and she emerged victorious. This should give us all hope. Thanks for watching, you guys. If you liked this video, make sure to hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe for more. See you next time and stay safe.